Our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Professor Oded Lipschitz, who is uh, a professor in the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near East Studies at Tel Aviv University. <coughs> Lipschitz serves as the director of the Sonia and Marco Nadler Institute of Archaeology. He is incumbent of the Austria Chair of the Archaeology of the Land of Israel in the biblical period and heads the Ancient Israel Studies MA program within the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near Eastern Cultures at Tel Aviv University. Professor Lipschitz is the laureate of the Emet Prize in the field of archaeology for the year 2022. And his talk today, the title of his talk, Those Who Live in These Ruins in the Land of Israel. Some thoughts on living in the shadow of ruins in Persian period Judah. Please, Dr. Professor Lipschitz, floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank God for organizing this fascinating conference. I want to thank the uh, people here in Khadarim for uh, their hospitality here. I want to thank all the friends and colleagues who came from all over Israel and the world for this conference, and even my students uh, who came from the center of the world in Tel Aviv all the way up to the Carmel. Thank you. It's a little bit weird to move from the center of the empire to this little province, you know, at the edge of the empire, but I don't know why this uh, little province is so interesting for us. And the aim uh, of, um, again, okay. The aim of this lecture is to add another layer of understanding the Jerusalemite ideology and theology of the Persian period as reflected in the biblical text, but also in the material culture, suggesting that throughout the Persian period, the tension between the poor reality the longing for the glorious past and the expectations for a divine change in the near future that is so clear in biblical texts written in this period is also reflected in the archaeology of Jerusalem. Unlike the rural settlement that continued to exist in the area around Jerusalem, the city itself was destroyed by the Babylonians and was left in ruins. Not much was changed in the Persian period, and from the archaeological perspective, Jerusalem didn't really exist as a city during most of the Persian and early Hellenistic periods. It was no more than a very small, poor, and sparsely populated village that existed around the temple. But the change occurred only in the Hasmonean period. In the following, I will suggest that for the people of the land, Amma Aritz, those who were not deported to Babylon before and after the destruction of Jerusalem, the ruined city symbolized the punishment that came upon the sinful Jerusalemite elite, contrary to their own fate, those who remained in Judah in their villages and on their land. For the exiled elite, in Babylon, and for the very few representatives who came back to Judah during the Persian period, the interpretation of the fate of Jerusalem and the condition of the ruined city were totally different. Priests, Levites, and other temple servants that lived during the Persian and early Hellenistic periods around the temple in this ruined city developed based on these ruins, the image of the past glorious Jerusalem. For them, these ruins were a proof to the greatness of the city in ancient times and the source for their hope for the glorious future. The legendary image, glory, a glorious Jerusalem, as much as it contrasted with the actual reality on the city in the Persian period was, on the one hand, the source of, and on the other hand, the fuel for the glorification of Jerusalem, which shaped the image of the city within the memory of the nation. The question was how much they can, and if at all they are allowed to actually change the fate of Jerusalem. The tension between the present situation and the hope for the change, as well as a bitter disappointment for the change that didn't come, did not exist only in the biblical text, but was daily reality that existed in Jerusalem. No, no, 
Quinto. During all the Persian and Hellenistic periods, part of it was an expression of the poverty that prevailed during this period, but part of it was an expression of the intentional reality of living in the shadow of the ruins of the past designed to perpetuate the past. This reality should be viewed as a landscape of memory of the Persian period, served as a physical and active reminder of the glories of the past intended to perpetuate the memory, not to accept the reality of the present, and perhaps it was also part of the attempt to speed up the long-awaited divine change. In this paper, after a short introduction about the problems with the study of the Persian period in Judah and the recent progress in the understanding of the material culture of this period, I will describe the origin and history of the Persian period rural settlement in Judah, demonstrating that this rural settlement is the evidence of the continued existence of the Amaretz, the people of the land, the people who remained in the little per peripheral province of Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of the elite and the urban society. These are the rural communities that preserved the traditional material culture in Judah from before the Babylonian destruction to the period after. And this is the rural settlement where the continuity of the imperial administration in Judah can be observed. This is the part of the people that according to their own understanding of the history, didn't sin and didn't get the punishment of destruction and exile for them the fate of Jerusalem is the ultimate proof for the sin of this elite and for the divine punishment they got in return. The destruction of Jerusalem stands in contrast to the continuity in the royal settlement surrounding the city and to the clear continuity evident in the administration and the rural economy. The fate of the city reflects the fate of the local elite that was deported to Babylon but from an archaeological point of view, no change was evident in Jerusalem after the 586 destruction and throughout the Babylonian, Persian, and early Hellenistic periods. Without the biblical description, we wouldn't have known about the existence of the return to Zion and the rebuilding of the temple. We couldn't know about it. Against this background, and against the background of the biblical descriptions, the change in Jerusalem must be understood as evidence of the return to Jerusalem of the Bnei Agola, the sign of the exiles, who are the Zerah HaKodesh, the holy seed, who got the approval on behalf of the Persian authorities and came to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. These returnees were a small representation group of the elite that was deported to Babylon with the destruction of the first temple. They were probably a very small community that had no expression in the material culture, nor is there any evidence of a demographic change in Judah throughout the Persian period. From the biblical descriptions, it appears that these elite, um, yeah, these elite, uh, those returnees to Jerusalem had difficulties in building the temple which was delayed for an entire generation. This is an evident not only to the small number of these returnees and the tension with those who remain in the land. Also among the small group of returnees, there were probably questions and doubt. Is it indeed the time to build the temple and the city? Is it even necessary to build it? Should we wait for a divine change and approval or do it ourselves? This is the base for my attempt to understand the reality revealed in the archaeological excavations in Jerusalem, especially the building from the Persian period in the Givati parking lot in the city of David, which was built right next, near, and within the ruins from the Iron Age city and continued to exist next to these ruins and right beside them all along the Persian period. I would suggest that landscape of memory existed in this period and people from the community of Retunese preferred to live alongside the glory of the past without a real attempt to actually change it, waiting for the divine signal and divine change that would come in the future. Basically, I said everything I want to say, but now I'll say it 
longer. <laughs> Historically, the Persian period is well dated and framed between Cyrus' conquest of Babylon in 539 BCE and the conquest of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great some 200 years later. But from the perspective of the material culture of Judah, the Persian period is only one link in a longer chain coming after the Babylonian period and followed by the early Hellenistic period. This is an intermediate period of 450 years between the high days of the Davidic dynasty in the 8th and 7th centuries BCE on the eve of the Babylonian destruction and the high days of the Hasmonean dynasty in the second half of the 2nd century BCE and in the early 1st century BCE. This is a very long period, similar in its length to the entire Iron Age that preceded it and to the Hellenistic Roman period that followed it. About one third of the entire first and second temple periods, but with very, f uh, very few historical sources and with very little information about the development processes and the material culture. This period is characterized by a poor material culture which developed gradually with almost no chronological anchors that make it possible to define clear historical key points within this process, and it is hard or nearly impossible to distinguish between the material culture characterizing the Babylonian, Persian, and early Hellenistic periods that developed slowly and gradually. In contrast to the detailed historical information from before this Persian period, and in contrast to the detailed source, re sources regarding the Hasmonean period that follows, the historical uh, sources about this 450 years period are few and scarce, and it is an unknown period from historical and archaeological point of view. The main difficulty with this period and the reason for the paucity of historical sources is that it is indeed Ah, this was before, yeah. It is indeed an intermediate period in which Judah existed as a poor province under the rule of the Babylonian, Persian, Ptolemaic, and Seleucid empires. During these 450 years in which there were no great destructions in Judah, decisive historical events, and in many aspects, throughout this long period, there is continuity in the existence of this poor and peripheral province, with sharp change that can be defined, dated, and be explained from the historical perspective. The starting point of this period is clear, the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE by the Babylonians and the deportation of a large part of the elite, which marked not only the change in the status of Judah from a semi-independent kingdom to a province, but also led to a sharp decline in all aspects of the material culture. Not only did the elite was deported and the urban centers were destroyed, but from this point in the history of Judah, there was no one to pay for, a good, for good artisans, and there was no one to demand high quality of professionals in all aspects of the material culture, from the production of pottery to building houses. According to the biblical description, many of the artisans were deported were deported to Babylon, including all the craftsmen and the smiths, together with the elite of the people, and thus, although there is a clear continuity in all areas of material culture in Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem, the most obvious archaeological phenomenon at the beginning of the Babylonian period is a sharp decline in the quality of all aspects in the material culture. It's worth noting that this characteristic of low quality of the material culture continued throughout the 450 years of Babylonian, Persian, and early Hellenistic periods, and a noticeable change occurred only at the beginning of the Hasmonean period with the renewal of the monarchy in Jerusalem. The other main characteristic of the Babylonian, Persian, and early Hellenistic periods is the continuity in the rural settlement, especially in the areas around Jerusalem. 
the rural economy and the administration of stamped jars with Ramat Rachel in the center of this system continued during all these 450 years with slow and gradual developments and changes. From the archaeological perspective, from the archaeological perspective, there is no clear transition between the Babylonian and Persian period. There are no distinct and clear phases within the Persian period, and there is no evidence of any change in the transition from the Persian to the Hellenistic period. Archaeologically, we could know anything about it. Throughout the entire period, there are no clear archaeological and chronological anchors, and the rural settlement is characterized by gradual and slow de development processes in which it is difficult to define clear stages. Progress in the study and understanding of the material culture of mainly the 200 years of the Persian period, but also the 50 years of the Babylonian period that preceded it, and the 150 years of the early Hellenistic period that followed came mainly on the basis of the excavation at Ramat Rachel, the progress of the study of stamp impressions on the handles and bodies of storage jars, and the ability to identify pottery assemblages from these periods and define their context and their development processes. Based on this development, in the last years, there are some first clear definitions of the characteristics of the post-586 BCE material culture, its connections to the preceding late Iron Age material culture, and the development process of the pottery types during the Babylonian and early Persian period, and this is by the PhD of Leora Freud and some paper that she published, and the late Persian and early, early Hellenistic periods, and this is by the PhD of Debbie Soundhouse, just submitted in Tel Aviv University. And this is a real advantage. If we're moving to the origin and history of the Persian period rural settlement in Judah, so this rural settlement that existed in Judah in the Persian and early Hellenistic period, and that characterized its settlement and economy until the establishment of the Hasmonean kingdom in the late second century BCE is rooted in its settlement, economy, and administration after it became a vassal Assyrian kingdom, and especially in the history of the land after Sennacherib's campaign in 701 BCE and the loss of the Shefelah that was given to the Philistine kingdoms. It is also the outcome of the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in the early 6th century BCE and the transition of Judah from a vassal kingdom to a Babylonian province. During this period, the Judahite population that continued to subsist in the northern Judean highlands as well as in the Be Benjamin region continued to preserve its economy, ways of life, administration, and material culture, and probably preserved also its identity as the people of Judah. The area of Benjamin became an important part of Judean economy and administration in the 7th century BCE, probably after the Shefelah was cut off from Judah as a result of Sennacherib campaign. The region was not destroyed during the Babylonian military campaign against Jerusalem in the early 6th century BCE and continued all the way to the Hellenistic period. The area to the south of Jerusalem with Ramat Rachel as its center probably had the same fate as the Benjamin region, and it seems that Babylonian period uh, uh, was the historical point in time when the city of Jerusalem was separated from the ag uh, agricultural area that surrounded it and became an independent district, the district of Jerusalem, probably with an attempt to isolate the city from the surroundings, leave it in its ruins with minimum role and function in the new province and let the region around it to continue to function as an agricultural land. The area to the north of Jerusalem became the district of Mitzpah, which is Benjamin, and the area to the immediate south of Jerusalem became the distri district of Beta Kerem, which is Ramat Rachel, with a center in Ramat Rachel. The administrative situation didn't change in the Persian period, and these three districts continued to exist even after the Persian authorization to rebuild the temple. Each district continued to function as a separate district with a specific role for each. Jerusalem became again the cultic center of the province, but 
remained isolated from its close surrounding, totally dependent in the Prussian uh, uh, support. Mitzpah, Benjamin, that became the political center of the province already during the Babylonian period, continued to function as such, and was also the center of the Pelech HaMitzpah, the district of Mitzpah, Benjamin district, and Ramat Rachel continued to function as the main administrative collection center for agricultural products and then paying taxes, and continued also to function as the center of the district of Beta Kerem, that including most of the rural settlement to the west and to the south of Jerusalem. This is the famous important district of Beta Kerem. Each site, Jerusalem, Mitzpah, and Beta Kerem, Ramat Rachel, had its specific function, and each site also functioned as a center of its own district. According to the archaeological material, Judah continued to exist as a rural society with the same geopolitical structure until the second century BCE. It is not only the role of Ramat Rachel that indicates the, in this direction, but also the continuation of the stamped jar administration. The corpus of stamped and incised jar handles found in Judah and especially in, in and around Ramat Rachel is a key to such an understanding. About 3,000 stamped jars were discovered in Judah during the archeological excavations and surveys. Uh, of the 600 years when the kingdom and the, then the province of Judah were under the rule of the empires. This is precisely the period when Ramat Rachel existed as the region's administrative and main collection center for agricultural products, primarily wine and oil stored in jars. In the Babylonian Persian Hellenistic period, Ramat Rachel was the main center of stamped jar handles. More than 60, 70 percent of all of it were found in Ramat Rachel. And all in all, the phenomenon of stamped jar handles collected and stored mainly in Ramat Rachel, continued during these exactly 600 years in a constant systemized administrative system that was based during uh, all this period on agricultural settlements, royal estates, administrative centers, and the system of districts in Judah. The origin and history of the Persian period rural settlement in Judah demonstrating that it is the evidence of the continued existence of these Am Ha'aret, the people of the land, who remain in Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of the elite and the urban society, mainly in the rural area around Jerusalem in the districts of the little peripheral province of Judah. This is the settlement that expresses the continuity in the material culture, and this is the settlement where the continuity of the imperial administration in Judah can be observed. This is also the place where the local Judahite identity was preserved alongside with memories, traditions, and beliefs. This is the part of the Judahite people that according to their own understanding of the history, didn't sin and didn't get the punishment of destruction and exile. For them, the fate of Jerusalem is the ultimate proof for the sin of the elite and for the divine um, punishment they got in return. This argument recalled Jeremiah uh, 2 and highlight the source of the Judean worldview, which apparently was expressed already in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 6. In response to this argument, Ezekiel in chapter 11 promised that those deported from their land are de de destined to return to Israel. He prophesied a green future for those who remained in his answer to them. Those who remain saw themselves as the people of God. Their presence in the land was fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham, according to Ezekiel 33. In reply, Ezekiel prophesied that they would be utterly destroyed. He is coming from the exiles in Babylon. Both of these arguments, as well as the prophet's harsh reply to them, reveal that profound ideological rift between the two parts of the nation at this time. In my opinion, the rift stemmed primarily from the blow to the status of the nation's leaders who were deported to Babylon and the attempt by those who remained to take the place of the deported elite and its property as expressed, for example, in Gedalia's talk to the local Judahites who were left in the land, telling them, take the land, take the fruits, and survive in the land. Now to Jerusalem. 
the destruction of Jerusalem stand in contrast to the continuity in the rural settlement surround, uh, surrounding the city and to the clear continuity evident in the administration and the rural economy. The fate of the city reflects the fate of the local elite that was deported to Babylon. But even in view of the heavy destruction of Jerusalem and the description of the deportations that took place as part of it, the picture of the complete emptying of the city seems problematic. On the one hand, hints of some continuity in the ritual and customs of mourning the, that took place in Jerusalem after the destruction were preserved in uh, the Old Testament. But also, from the archaeological point of view, the picture seems to be much more complex than what was described only five or ten years ago, partly also by me. The southwestern hill was abandoned from the end of the Iron Age and until the beginning of the Hellenistic period, and only few portraits and small amount of artifacts from the Persian period were exposed in this area, in most cases in places from the Hellenistic and Roman periods, in fields and everything, without any stratigraphic connection. However, already Kenyon, based on her excavation in the city of David, believed that the Babylonians hadn't destroyed all the areas in the first temple city. In her opinion, some of the residents continued to live there after the destruction and continued to hold some of the ceremonies in the temple. This view of Kenyon was expanded by Gabi Barkai based on his finds from the excavations at Ketef Hinnom, and he claimed that families of the elite continued to live in, the, in Jerusalem after the destruction. It seems to me that the find of the excavation conducted by Eilat Mazar in the northern tower in area G, as well as various pottery finds and stamp impressions from most of the excavation in the city of David, attest to the continued existence in this area during the 6th century BCE. Now we can identify stamp impression and pottery from the 6th century BCE here in the city of David, even if it in unclear size and extent. The main point is that, from an archaeological point of view, no change can be recognized in the transition from the 6th to the 5th century BCE, from the time of the Babylonian exile to the days of the return to Zion. The myth of the mass return stands clear from the archaeological perspective, and it seems that also a careful analysis of the biblical text can support this conclusion that there is no clear boundary between the Babylonian period and the Persian period, between the exilic period and the post-exilic period, the time of the return. Furthermore, from all the 300 years of the Persian and early Hellenistic period, and until the Hasmonean establishment of the Jerusalem as, a, as their capital, no clear finds were exposed in the excavation conducted in the city, and besides some remains of very poor buildings that were built in the Persian and early Hellenistic period among the ruins from the Babylonian destruction without clearing these ruins, among the ruins, inside the ruin, between the ruins, only portraits, stamp impression, and other small finds were exposed. Very similar to what was found in Jerusalem from the sixth century, from the exilic period, the time of the Babylonian exile. Here too, most of the finds were exposed in later fields and without any clear stratigraphic or architectural context. Based on archaeological data from the Persian period, as well as from the early Hellenistic period, it seems that from the archaeological perspective, Jerusalem hardly existed during all this long period. There is no way of knowing what the extent of settlement was on the Temple Mount itself. We cannot excavate there, of course. But in view of the existing data, the settlement in the city of David throughout the Persian period was small and very poor. The settlement area of Jerusalem during the Persian and Hellenistic period included an area of maximum 50 dunams. The population of Jerusalem didn't include more than 200 to 300 families, and I'm the maximalist. There are much more minimalist views. Maybe Israel will talk about it later. It means that no more than 1,000, maybe 1,250 people um, uh, lived in Jerusalem during this period and we should interpret the return to Zion as a very slow, very minimal 
a gradual process that didn't leave its imprint on the archaeological data. Again, from archaeological perspective, no change. Sixth, fifth, fourth, third centuries. Jerusalem is a very poor village. And what happened in the Temple Mount? We don't know. Against the background of the biblical descriptions, especially in Ezra and Nehemiah and in Haggai and Zechariah, and assuming that there is historical re reliability in these descriptions, the change in Jerusalem must be understood as evidence of the return to Jerusalem of Bene Hagola, who are the Zera HaKodesh, the Holy Seed, who got the approval on behalf of the Persian authorities and came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. These returnees were a small representation group of the elite that was deported to Babylon with the destruction of Jerusalem in the early 6th century BCE. And as described above, there is no evidence of this in the material culture, nor is there any evidence of a demographic change in Judah throughout the Persian period. Who was the, that elite and what was its interest? As stated, the deportation from Judah was limited in scope and selective. At the center of the exile was a Jerusalemite elite which had led the people in Judah since the beginning of its history. At the same time, most of the population of the kingdom of Judah remained in place on the land and in their villages around Jerusalem. For the first time, this population had to live without the religious, political, and economic elite that had always dominated it. The tension between the two parts of the people was clear and understandable and included serious disagreements, economic, political, social, and religious. The days of the exile among them, this elite of the people was cut off from the people in the land was a special and short period in time, and 50 years after the destruction and the deportation of the representatives of the exile in Babylon got the authority to return to Jerusalem and to build the temple. According to the biblical description, Cyrus, who had just finished conquering Babylon and inheriting its vast empire, allowed the rebuilding of the temple and thus restored its status. He also permitted those who would build the temple to return to Jerusalem and gave the same elite in Babylon the authority to reestablish their status over the people who remained in Judah. The target audience of the declaration are part of the Judean exilic community in Babylon who were chosen to go up to Jerusalem to build the temple. There is no wider authorization here to go to Judah for any other purpose or to change the legal or demographic situation in Judah. The return is only to Jerusalem and is only for the purpose of building the temple. When all the people who remain in Babylon must help with donations to build the temple. And we know how many Judeans are contributing and donate since until today. Even in the description of the performance of Cyrus' declaration, the emphasis is exactly the same. The returnees are only those who were chosen to build the temple, priests, Levites, temple servants, and to go up to Jerusalem for this purpose only. And the rest of the people who remain in Babylon are assisting in donations and presents. Moreover, the continuation of the description include the return of the temple vessels that were exiled by the Babylonians before they destroyed it. This closes the, circle, the cycle of destruction and exile, the recess that was in worship in the temple and things uh, come in place. The second temple period could begin. This is the ideology. What about the other territory around the temple. What about Jerusalem itself? From the biblical description, it appears that those returnees to Jerusalem had difficulties in building the temple, which was delayed for an entire generation. Together with the very poor situation in Jerusalem uh, 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 during all the uh, Persian period, as indicated in the archaeology, it is evidence not only to the small number of these returnees and not only for the tension and on, not only for the tension um, with those who remain in the land, 
lived with no temple in Jerusalem for about 50 years, and probably so, the destruction of Jerusalem as part of the punishment that came on the Jerusalem elite and had problems to accept the new situation of the return. This seems to me more than that, as a desire not to change the existing situation in Jerusalem, to live within the landscape of memory of the city's glorious past as evidence for the tension between the poor reality, the longing for the glorious past, and the expectations for a divine change in the near future, and perhaps it was also part of the attempt to speed up the long-awaited divine change. The few dozens of priests, Levites, and other temple servants that lived during the Persian and early Hellenistic period in this small Temple village, I don't have other name to Jerusalem than temple village, around the temple developed, based on these ruins, the image of the past glorious Jerusalem. For them, these ruins were the testament to the greatness of the city in ancient times and the source of their hope for a glorious future. The legendary image of glorious Jerusalem, as much as it contrasted with the actual reality of the city in the Persian period, was on the one hand the source for, and on the other hand the fuel for the glorification of Jerusalem in the Persian period, which shaped the image of the city within the memory of the nation. The question was how much the people in Jerusalem can, and if at all, they are allowed to actually change the fate of Jerusalem. The tension between the present situation and the hopes for the change, as well as bitter disappointments for the change that didn't come. It didn't come when they came back to Jerusalem. It didn't come when they built the altar. It didn't come when they actually built the temple. It didn't come even when they tried to build a wall around Jerusalem didn't exist only in the biblical text, but was a daily reality that existed in Jerusalem during all the Persian and early Hellenistic periods. Among the small group of returnees, there were probably questions and doubts. Is it indeed the time to build the temple and the city? Is it even necessary to build it? Should we wait for a divine change and approval? Now, this is in the biblical text. We can read it in Haggai 1, with this idea in mind, the time for the building of the temple has not come yet. And also in Zechariah 1, verse 12, can be interpreted in this direction. Ezekiel, for example, yeah, Ezekiel, for example, speaks of the existence of the ruins in the land as evidence of God's existence and power, and that the restoration of the ruins is related to the purification of sins, God's forgiveness, and the rebuilding of the land that will only be done when time is come. So who knows when time will come? This is the base for my attempt to understand the reality revealed in the archaeological excavation in Jerusalem, especially the building from the Persian period in the Givati parking lot in the city of David, excavated by Yuval Gadot and Iftar Shaleh from Tel Aviv and IA, which was built right next, near, and within the ruins from the Iron Age, and continued to exist next to these ruins and right beside them during all the Persian period. This is a great example of the reality of life in the, of the elite of Jerusalem during the Persian period, who had trade relations and material culture that testified to the status of those who lived in the houses that were built next to the temple. And you can see the connections with Tyre. And we have now, we have here someone who even wrote a paper on this thing, but was built into the ruins of the city from the days of the first temple. And so that every, uh, if you want to read it, every time someone left the house, he saw in front of him and around him the ruins of the building that were not evacuated throughout the Persian period. So destruction was a daily life phenomenon in the Persian period among the priests and Levites who lived in Jerusalem. This is the meaning of a landscape of memory, and these people who lived in these houses were like this in everyday level. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dad. Very illuminating, very instructive paper. And I found it very helpful to see that we have this kind of continuity from the Babylonian area to the Persian period and the Hellenistic period. And I see some, because I'm now more into the Transjordan region, we have the same problem there, right? So my first very little question, and I have two questions, is aren't there any distinctive marker like, uh, but for example, in Transjordan, we sometimes find in the Persian period like this attic import wear, where we, this is clearly defined, the periods, and so maybe there is something to find in Jerusalem and the other periods. That's the first question, very short. I'll, and just, the other I'll, I'll just answer. Yeah? Yes. Uh, now when we uh, have, we don't even need the uh, import pottery because now we know very well the slow development of the local pottery. Yeah. Uh, we okay. have it in Ramat Rachel, we have it now in Jerusalem, and we can see it. But again, it's not that we can see a pre-701 or post-701 pottery like we know from Judah, for example, but we see that the development is very, very slow. And again, when you see a pottery, you cannot really differentiate if it's late 5th century, early 4th yeah, century, right. middle 4th century, late. The development are very, very slow, very uh, low quality, and very local. Yeah. The import is there. You, you can see it. we have import. And the second question, what I found very intriguing, and I will keep this in mind, because it's somehow the first time I realized it, that it's a, a thing, that you have this continuity from the, local, from the locals, not, of course, the myth of the, the empty land, myth of the this completely destroyed city, myth of the, the all of, the, they all returned at once. But uh, if you stress this continuity of the people in and around Jerusalem, do we have a good explanation why this group of people, and you were even talking about Elites living and uh, having this continuity in Jerusalem, why they are not um, displayed in, a, in such a manner in the biblical text? Like, it's not easy to identify this group. Even Ezra, Nehemiah, they are only talking about the people, the returnees, and they are rebuilding the city, but not, none of the texts is very directly speaking about the people that stayed in the land and then helped building up Jerusalem. It's always the people that came back, like this idea. Yeah, no, in this case, I, I think the explanation is very clear, and uh, I wrote about it, some other wrote about it. You know, the, the winners dictate the history. You know, public relation, and we can see it now in the, our new government, you know, the winners are dictating the history. And uh, the story that they are telling is the winning story. So no question that the elite in Babylon and the representatives who came to Jerusalem, they had much better public relation office and they won. The history as we know it is the history as they told it. It's not the his it's, it's one history that was told, but th this is the, but even in this history, we can see some other histories reflected. You know, again, it's, it's well known in biblical studies and many of the people here know it. Um, but no question that even, the, think about the idea that the book of Kings ends with the destruction, a little bit uh, uh, of the main thing, and then the book of Ezra and Nehemiah start with the allowance to, to come. So they totally ignored what was in the middle. So we can see how, how it is. But again, there were many histories and one main history that won. Okay. Uh, I have a very minor remark about you dating the... Um, the campaign of Alexander started in 333, but in the Levant it was, uh, the, his control started in 331, so you're we right, have to, right. to end the uh, community. Yeah. Right. A, a second remark, J just uh, I, I would just say that uh, Ran, Ran is right, of course, you know, Alexander the Great uh, campaign was not one year, but uh, when I was a kid and I loved history, uh, you know, I couldn't uh, uh, stop saying Shalosh, 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 Alexander uh, Barosh. So this is the date of Alexander. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the second is the, um, what Barakai discovered and, uh, or, or at least uh, uh, assessed, assessment, is his assessment about the uh, remains in the city of David. Of, of, so uh, it should be uh, uh, pointed out that squatters uh, a Levant-wide uh, phenomenon, uh, especially in peri after periods of, of course, after the periods of, uh, of destruction, and is very common in uh, uh, the transition between the uh, very clear between the transition between the the um, uh, during the transition between the uh, Bronze Age and the Iron Age, which is uh, yeah, in yeah. many in many places. Uh, in You're right. Yeah. Uh, 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 
Ron is right about, you know, the post-destruction uh, um, find, you know, in archaeology. But here, as I try to, to show the uh, difference between the situation in Jerusalem itself and what happened just around it. You know, Ramat Rachel continued to exist like there was no Babylonian destruction. Ramat Rachel continued to exist like there was no return. And if you go to Babylon, to the Benjamin region, to the north of Jerusalem, they wouldn't know, you know, about, or maybe they, there is even development because of the Jerusalem destruction. And even the Rephaim Valley, the area of Mozart, you know, we have continuation all over. So the, the, it's a kind of, a, the, the, the Babylonians just went to the head, you know, had one bullet in the head and went out. So, and I think that it was the same, but Jerusalem was not, or Judah was not the same because I wrote about it and now you're dealing with it. It was the same situation in Ammon. In Ammon, we can see a campaign straight to the capital, one bullet in the head, and they, the, all the rural area continues around. And it's right that we have many problems, archaeological problems, to see what happened post-destruction. But on the other hand, it's also very easy because the destruction is a starting point to what happened afterwards. And we can see the starting point, everything that was built above the destruction. We can clearly see it. But what we see is a very, very poor, small, you know, society that established very gradually, very slowly, in, and not, we cannot see one, one uh, event that people came to Jerusalem. Again, we don't know what happened in the Temple Mount. Don't know. But around it, where we can understand what happened, the situation is very clear, even if it's very, based on very negative uh, find. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk. Toda did. One, one remark and one question. You were talking about uh, the, the debate in, in between the people, when to build, what to build, and, and um, when, when should it end? And, and the answer is, lo et bo, at the time of Zechariah and uh, yeah. Haggai. Yeah. But the, question, the, the, the answer was given already by uh, the prophecy of Jeremiah, 70 years. Yeah. So you just have to ask when to start those 70 years and when to finish them. So th that's one remark, but... but I, I will it, just it, tell you about this remark. It's clearly that we have different groups yeah. discussing these problems. Yeah, sure. And I, I try to say at least three different groups. One is the uh, people who remained, that they didn't want to build. Again, it would, maybe there were also different voices between them. <coughs> and at least two voices among the returnees. The people who say, let's wait, and the people who say, let's build. And we yes. can see Haggai, Zechariah, yeah, yeah. we can see the Israel and Nehemiah. They had different attitudes, but even... Even this is, um, um, is important to explain the archaeological situation that we have. I just spoke with Conrad this morning that I want him to join me and to write a paper that the title would be To Build or Not to Build. And we can gather these, uh, these uh, you know, and try to, to, to speak about the different groups that were in Jerusalem and the, the debate that went, was between them because on the base of archaeology, and I think that archaeology is giving us the option to go back, you know, it's not high court archaeology. Archaeology is only giving us the, the option to go back to the biblical text and ask questions. And I think that this is the, the only window that I try to open in this lecture. It's divine. So now the question is... Yeah, I agree, and I don't think, again, I have this discussion with many of my colleagues. I don't think that you need a rich city with a lot of money and a lot of people to write and edit text. All you need is the 100, 200 priests, Levites, people who, you know, in the Middle Ages were the most uh, literary, fungal. you know, it was in monasteries, very poor monasteries uh, in Europe. So you do huh? Do you think that uh, Qumran uh, was much better shaped place and we see the, te the te textual work there? So I think that all you need is fire inside you. This is what you need. And maybe 
maybe, maybe when you live in such a ruined place. And this, this is what he tried to say. The ruined place that you live in, this is the fire that you that is, is leading you. This is, a, apropos the Zoroastrian thing, this is what pushing you, you know, to, to, uh, um, uh, to see what will happen. And I think, and again, I wrote it many times, I think that the ups and downs in the Persian period, the expectation that th change will come. People came from Babylon, they expected the change will come and nothing happened. People built the altar, expected that God will bring any change and nothing happened. They built the temple, expecting that something will come and nothing happened. They built a wall, kind of something around Jerusalem, and nothing happened. So the ups and downs are a reflection of this fire that was in Jerusalem during this time of, again, fire, you need 100, 200 people, it's enough for them, and the text is part of the production of this, uh, uh, these people. And again, I don't think that we need many people. You need a good pen, one laptop, and you can do everything you want. <laughs> oh, Dad. Tell me, have you dealt with the archaeology of the Udumean Ostrica? And how does that fit into the picture? Because Idumea in, is in your, in your uh, map. Yes. So, um, <laughs> in a paper that I wrote together with my colleague Daphna Langut, uh, we showed, I think, uh, the historical archaeological explanation for the amazing work that you and others are doing about this Idumea and Ostraka. And what we tried, and I think that this is also important to understand what we are saying here. What we could, what we could uh, say, uh, one minute, okay? I have one. What we could see is that from archaeological material and for the palynological work that Daphna made, we can see that from the middle or the late 6th century and for more than 100, maybe 150 years, there was a very dry climate in this area, and it means that the area of less than 400 millimeters of rain, which is the line of Azekah Hebron, so the southern Shfel, center southern Shefela and the southern Judean hills, cannot exist from the agricultural perspective. So these people who were left in the land had to leave this area in the late Babylonian, early Persian period, probably went to closer to Jerusalem, closest to Bechemi, to the north, and this area was empty for many of the Judean people there. And so Edomians and Nabataeans, which were mainly uh, uh, work with herds of sheep and goats, could go in because they could survive in this area. Around 450, climate changed. And suddenly we had a very wet climate for something like 100 years, 120, 130% of the average. So all these Bedouins, Edomians, Nabataeans who came into the region could be settled and could become agriculture. And this is a change of the establishment of the province of Edomia. And what we are trying to say, this is the background, historical archaeological background for your Ostraka. So suddenly there is agriculture. Suddenly you have administration. Suddenly this area can be... And, but, but as you know very well, most of the people are Arabs, Edomians, Nabataeans, only few Judean names in this area. So what we try to do is to explain historically, ecologically, what you people of the Ostraka are demonstrating very nicely while working on the Ostraka. So it's, it's the paper that was published. Oh, yo, yo, now I'm... No, no, no. It would be nice. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so first of all, Oded, it was fascinating as usual. I have a question that has to do somehow with uh, what we think about historical uh, social relations and then something about the, the, the book of Ezra. So, first of all, I'm asking about the break that you described between Amma Aretz and the elite living in Jerusalem. But, you know, in order to be an elite, you need to be an elite of something. So, and that other, that non-elite part needs to sustain the elite. So, how can you provide an elite that's there in Jerusalem, like you say, a few hundred people in Jerusalem, who are they the elite of? Who sustained them? And then the other question which relates to it is that, well, in Ezra you know, chapter 2 and those lists, of course you can debate the date of these, day, of these lists and so on, but the returnees did take rural settlements according to that source. 
So okay. my question is, how do you read these? Okay, so about Ezra 2, Nehemiah 7, I, I wrote long papers, as you know, trying to explain the origin of it. No one is claiming that uh, it, it was connected to the small Jerusalemite people, and you know, the main thing in this uh, list is who is responsible for donating some money to build the walls of Jerusalem. Never mind, leave this thing. You are right about the definition of elite. What is this elite and who supported them? And again, in some other papers that are not in the paper today, I try to say that since Jerusalem was cut off from all the agricultural area around it. So in the Persian period, the, the priests, Levites, temple servants, this was the elite in Jerusalem. These are the scribes who wrote and edited the scrolls you know, that they had. They were totally dependent on donations and support by the Babylonian Gola and the Persian king. And this, again, we can see in the text how much the Persian king is becoming or replacing or he is the one who support the temple, the people in the temple, and the Babylonian. So I think that they didn't have much, and they, and, and they were totally dependent on the um, uh, uh, gifts and the support they got from outside. They had no... And this was also, we wrote, we had a big book on the Ptolemaic period, because in the Ptolemaic period there was a change. Ptolemaic had a different system of, dona of, of supporting temples and land, temple lands. And I think that this was a change, it was a shift. We can see it even in the Yehud's temperature. And again, we wrote about it in different places. And um, uh, um, the, the, the uh, source of, of, let's say, author authorization that the, this elite got is from the Persian king. He gave them the permission to go back. The governors were among them. The, then the priest became the most important person. So it was not any more economic land owners <laughs> or a kind of natural elite that is growing in the land, this elite now, after 50 years of exile, this new elite, the local elite was in Benjamin, the local elite was in Ramat Rachel and the other areas. The people in Jerusalem were the cultic religious elite and the place of Jerusalem in this Persian period was only as the cultic center of the people in Judah. I would just end with one minute of, of, of a story because we are excavating now for some years a temple in Moza. And this is the only surviving temple from the first temple that we can actually see. It was built with a Solomonic temple in Jerusalem and existed all along the first temple period. The change, and it's amazingly to see the change, was in the Persian period because the temple, sti the temple in, in, in uh, Moza still stood because archaeologically you can see that the walls were robbed only in the early Hellenistic period. So in the Persian period, this temple stood but didn't function. And we can see a small house, domestic structure that was built just in the court of it. And this is, for me, another indication for the power of Elitum Jerusalem of not allowing other temples in Jerusalem at this time. And another place of, if you want, landscape of memory, because people lived near the temple in Moza. They saw the temple that, you know, was the center of this area for 400 years, like the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple didn't function. And they just lived by this temple, standing, but not functioning. So Persian period is fascinating from all the changes and everything that happened uh, there. And I think that we have much more room for another, con God, another conference on, on many of these uh, subjects can be planned. The way you've built a social history based on the archaeology is, is, is fantastic, but we also have uh, a social history that we can build from the Persian documentation, and the imperial program is coming into view, and, and it, it, it works nicely, but in some places, challenges the social history have just based on archaeology. And I'm not going to keep the people from their coffee, so we'll talk about it later. We'll about but it. uh, it's, I, a, it's a nice angle to, but, to this, but, you're right. But, but it's, it, it's really interesting. Yeah. You're right. Thank you.